Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn. I'm super excited today to have our very own Natalie De La Cruz with us to talk a little bit about um, being a youth engagement specialist here at Heron Project and tell a little of our um, her own story. I'm Kristen Young. I'm the clinical director for Heron Project. Um, just a couple of housekeeping tips before we get started. We are taking questions. Um, if you have any, please put them. If you are on the uh, webinar on Zoom, put them right in the Q&A box. That's at the bottom of your screen. If you're on an iPad or a tablet, you might have to tap the screen to have it pop up. If you are on Facebook Live, you can put it right in the comments and um, the questions will get to us. Just as an aside, this is not confidential, so please don't put any identifying information of the people um, that if you're asking questions regarding a loved one. So welcome, Natalie. Super excited to have you today. Do you want to give us a little brief introduction of who you are? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, so as you mentioned, my name is Natalie. I use she, her pronouns. I'm a first year at Northeastern University, and I am the Youth Engagement Specialist for the Heron Project. Yay, that's awesome. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit of, of your story and how you know you ended up finding your way into doing this kind of work? Absolutely. So I am in long-term recovery myself. Um, I have struggled with mental health issues almost my entire life. Um, and I really fell into substance use when I was actually in seventh grade, which is one of the reasons that I'm really passionate about prevention and getting our word out to the younger generation because a lot of prevention initiatives start in high school and college. Um, but as I just mentioned, I started when I was in seventh grade when I was 12 years old. Uh, so it's really important to me that we move it to the younger generation. Uh, yes, but I started using substances uh, when I was in middle school um, and I've been in recovery ever since around like freshman year of high school, um, which because I only did three years of high school is about four years now. Um, and I found the Heron Project my sophomore year of high school when we had a presentation, unfortunately not from Chris Heron himself uh, because of COVID and stuff like that, but we had sort of virtual presentation and my school administration, who I was very close with, he came to me and he said, you know, I know you're very interested in this topic. Would you be interested in starting a club, a Heron Project club? So I was like, yes, of course. Started a Heron Project club at my high school in Connecticut. Uh, I became a youth ambassador. Last year, I became president of the Youth Ambassadors, and now I am the Youth Engagement Specialist. Wow, that's awesome. So 12, you started at 12. Wow. Yeah. That's, now, did you find that some of your peers were also starting about that time, or were you kind of on the front end of it? Yeah, see, it was really interesting, because at that time, I think it's very, very split. Uh, I was hanging around older kids, um, but not even like that much older, like one or two years older, and they were already in the like the throes of it. Um, so there were a lot of students in my grade, a lot of my peers, a lot of my classmates, a lot of my friends who truly did not understand what I was going through or like why I was doing what I was doing, um, who were just having very opposite experiences of me. But then there are also a lot of people that were going through really similar things. And I think that as time goes on, that's unfortunately going to be an issue that we see more of. A lot more students are going to start using substances earlier and dealing with mental health challenges earlier. Um, Obviously, with the pandemic, even elementary schoolers have been struggling with their mental health a lot. And so, unfortunately, I think we really need to get ahead of this because substance use rates are definitely going to skyrocket. Oh, I think, yeah, and they already have. Yeah. We're, we're definitely right now in an epidemic when it comes to mental health issues and, and substance use issues. And it is starting earlier and earlier. So I know yeah. you're definitely not alone. I know a lot of the kids that I work with at this point are struggling to get back into school from yeah. having been out of school for so long. So the transition is tough. Yeah, and I'm, I'm in college, like I mentioned, and uh, a lot of college, first year college students, especially because they kind of missed out on that high school experience or trying to like make up for it in college by like partying very hard, using a lot of substances. And unfortunately that's led to an uptick in accidental overdoses mm -hmm. um, because students are pushing the limits and aren't used to like being in this kind of environment. They're not used to being in these large social settings and they don't know like, honestly, like, self-control and it's it's really really difficult to watch right now I can imagine especially having already been there yeah now so you have been you went almost through your your entire high school experience so as a sober student yeah what was that like yeah there were definitely points 
Um, I mean, I love to stress, I love like the idea that recovery isn't linear. Like I was not entirely sober my high school experience. And I'll be very open about that because it was, it was really, really difficult at some points, especially at the beginning of the pandemic with quarantine and isolation, all that super difficult. Um, but I always like found my way back here. And I think starting the Heron Project Club and then becoming a youth ambassador was really, really important to me for that because it gave me a reason and a community to be involved with because as you can imagine, not a lot of students are sober in high school or going into college. So knowing that there are other people out there and having like a community of people that really support you. Um, I think also being on the staff on Heron Project now has helped me a lot because um, when we have our like weekly staff meetings or we do like mission moments where we share like people's stories, it's really inspiring to hear these stories of people who've been in recovery for like decades um, and just listening to them and knowing that that can be me and stuff like that. It's really important to have that community. Right. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you brought that up about the uh, recovery not being linear because mm -hmm. I feel like most families struggle with this idea. Yeah. It's, if somebody relapses, it's like, oh my gosh, it's over. They screwed it all up. We, we all we're starting over. And that's not necessarily the truth, right? Yeah. For a lot of people, those relapses actually lead to stronger recovery. Did you find that in, for you in some of those instances? Oh, 100%. I think a lot of it for me was like, who I had around me because I think my support system has been the biggest thing for me and when I was in like seventh grade eighth grade when I was really really struggling I, I didn't have the best group of people around me so they weren't like I wasn't being encouraged to be sober but now that I have that even if I mess up even like if something goes wrong, I know that I have these people that I can turn to and I know that I'll come back stronger. So I, I do definitely relate to that. Um, and it's been really helpful for me to know that even if something goes wrong, like I know that I can get back to where I am because of like where I physically am in my life and also like who I have around me. Right. It doesn't have to be a life ending yeah. experience it can be or a sobriety ending experience or a recovery ending experience it can be a learning experience and you can get right back on the next day and that's the way I feel like anything that we struggle with in life should be this idea that you have to start over from the beginning every time you make a decision that isn't necessarily in your best interest the world doesn't end right mm -hmm. not that we want to encourage it obviously but it happens and it happens at all levels I want to talk for a second about how hard it is as an adult I'm not in recovery and how hard it is to go out with friends sometimes um, and not have a drink, right? Even as a 45 year old woman who's not in recovery, oftentimes I don't really, I don't really want to drink. I see the damage that a lot of substances do. So oftentimes I choose not to, and it's hard for me as a 45 year old woman sometimes, right? And this is the thing that I feel like a lot of parents don't often understand is that we want our kids to just say no, but we don't acknowledge how hard that is is it is such a difficult thing so I feel like the dialogue needs to be more about that you're not a bad person if you make a choice that isn't necessarily who you want to be right yeah. because it's hard right so let's talk about it and let's not villainize the person let's talk about how tough that is right do you find that I mean I I remember being a teenager and I work with a lot of teenagers not not taking substances, not going along with the crowd is really hard. The stakes when you are 16, 17, 18 years old are very high. Yeah. Yeah. And even like at the younger ages, when you're trying to like prove yourself, especially when you're going into high school um, and you want to be around like the older kids, the cool kids, you want to be invited to these parties you want to show them that like you're one of them the pressure is even higher and I think even like in college it's the same thing because it's like a lot of my friends came into college not having any experiences with substances and once they were thrown into like this environment where they're everywhere it was impossible for them to say no even though they them like their whole lives they had said no they had like not used any substances but coming here it was just like such a change that um they fell into it um and i'm very thankful that they're all very supportive of like my journey and my decisions uh and i think that's another really important thing is that um i have friends that do drink they do smoke they do that kind of stuff um but they're very very respectful about like me and my decisions uh for example it was just my birthday like a few weeks ago and <clears throat> 
some friends were drinking but they got me like sparkling cider instead so that I could still be like with them and still like doing stuff with them um but keeping my sobriety which is really really thoughtful of them and uh just the point I'm trying to make is that it's possible to find those kinds of people in college you just need to look for them so you can still have fun even though yeah. you don't that's oh fun. yes that's one of the things <laughs> I've been doing on the TikTok um at Heron Project um is doing this like sober in college series and I did this one of um me at a party where I was sober and I was talking about how <clears throat> like even if you're the only sober one at the party like it doesn't matter nobody knows unless you tell them and when I tell people because I obviously like am very open about it um everybody's always like that's really cool like I respect that a lot um because <clears throat> because it's like a show of courage and strength and saying like you know I, I'm not afraid to say that I'm sober right now and I'm here with you guys I'm having the same amount of fun as you guys um but I know that I'm being true to myself. Right. Absolutely. Yep. So what would you say, like from, from a, a, a adult perspective, from a parent perspective, what do you think that this generation needs from us? What do you think would be helpful for parents to understand and to know going forward when they're trying to support their kids through all of this? I think awareness is the biggest thing. Um, being aware of the signs is really important because, you know, as you know, kids are really sneaky and they can hide things, but knowing the signs of your child struggling with mental health issues, substance use, um, so that you can openly communicate with them about it, um, not like skirting around it or trying to hide it or anything like that. Like, I think openly and directly communicating with them about it is really important. And also um, just kind of another point of the awareness is being aware of like the context of the situation. Like, like you said, it's not as easy to say no as some people would think um, and the pressures are everywhere. So also just being aware of that and being aware that it doesn't make your kid a bad kid. It doesn't make them a troubled kid, stuff like that. Yeah, that's one of the things that I've been seeing a lot lately is that we have to stop labeling kids as like troubled kids. Um, because they're not, they're good people. Um, sometimes like hard decisions are just put upon us. Right. Absolutely. Especially in today's world. Yeah. I think it's really, really tough to be a kid in school systems. <clears throat> I want to back it up for a second and talk a little bit about the mental health issue, because oftentimes I don't feel like our society talks about that part enough is that happy people don't use drugs and alcohol, right? Even the kids that say they just did it to to get in with the crowd or to be a part of the crowd are still struggling with an inferiority or a self-esteem issue if they're going to make a choice that's outside of who they want to be so they can fit in, right? So we're still talking about a mental health, potentially not necessarily from like a, a pathological place. Not everybody who chooses to use substances has a diagnosable mental illness, but we're still talking about depression, anxiety, things like that, that are leading us down the road to drug use, right? So I think one of the things that I've noticed significantly in our society that's changed since I was a kid is A, the pressure that you guys are under. I mean, what do you have to do, or at least what are you told you have to do in order to, su to succeed in this society today, right? Well, first of all, happy Mental Health Awareness Month. Yes, yes. Um, and so, yeah, what I think the biggest thing for me and in, in my community is college like at my high school it was an expectation and in my family especially like it was an expectation that you're going to college and not just any college like you're going to a good college so I think the pressure of like academic success is a really really big thing and when people don't receive that academic validation they don't receive the grades they want or they don't get into like a certain program or something like that it can be really really damaging and it's interesting because that might not be the first thing you think of when you think of like a reason somebody would use substances you might think of like social pressure and stuff like that um but at least like in the crowds that I surrounded myself in high school that was a really big thing yeah. And I brought that up and I'm glad you went there because that's what I see when I'm working with young people today. Yeah. It's, it's definitely a switch. And I'm not sure if people are aware of this, but um, high achievers have been added to the list of at-risk youth. So a decade ago, yeah, a decade ago, we didn't worry about those kids. We didn't talk about those kids. There was no, we didn't expect them to show up in our office. And now I see more of those kids than I do the kids who are struggling with, you know, trauma and major family issues. And I think that's a really important topic to discuss. Yeah. Right? How much pressure are we putting on our kids right now 
to succeed in a way that's not allowing them to grow and have fun and be kids and how much anxiety are we creating, right? In this idea that you have to be perfect in order to be successful, yeah. right? Because I have something that I say frequently to a lot of people I work with is you can't be both perfect and happy. You have to choose one. The two are mutually Ooh, exclusive. I like that. Right? Yeah. So if you're trying to, I mean, I see kids that are like down on themselves because they have a 4.2 GPA instead of a 4.5. That's insane. There was no such thing as a 4.2 when I was in school. It was a 4.0. That was it. That was all you get. That was the highest. Most of us were not there and there was no, oh my God, you're not going to be successful because you're not going to go to the top college. Right. It's really sad because none of it's actually true. And I feel like we're creating a, a, a generation that's going to not succeed, not because they're not capable, because their anxiety level is shooting up so high that they're not able to function or they're getting involved in substances. And it's not that they won't be successful, but they're going to make the journey more difficult, right? It's not going to be a straight line. What are your thoughts on that? I have a really interesting perspective on that because I feel like I'm both I started as the kid that had like a lot of like trauma and family issues and things like that. And that's why I turned to substances. But then I also underlying was always the high achiever kid. And so in high school, that was my biggest issue was I was feeling the pressures of that. So just like you have both the dichotomy of that is really interesting to me. Um, but I think that having high achievers as like one of the most at risk groups is like a really interesting thing to recognize because those are obviously the last people you would think of um but just from my perspective and what I've seen those are the kids that use the most um especially around like in college like around final season uh last semester during finals there was a student um who died in the library oh. during finals that's awesome. Um, suspected suicide, suspected overdose. Okay. Um, and you just can't help but wonder, like, was that student one of the high achievers? Right. Um, and just putting that in that perspective and thinking about, like, the pressures, the specific pressures that those students are under, it makes sense that they'd be turning to substances. Um, and I think we really do need to shift uh, the culture in terms of like how we talk about colleges and how we define that as like success and like which colleges mean success and stuff like that. I've seen a really good post going around about like how we need to congratulate both the kids that are going to their dream schools and the kids that aren't. We need to congratulate kids that are going to the military and going to trade school. And we need to congratulate all kids that are doing like what they want to be doing um, because success isn't like a singular thing it doesn't mean going to like a specific school it means like being where you want to be right it's also not a straight line right which you found out because your journey was not a straight line right oh absolutely not <laughs> definitely <laughs> and, squiggles right and mine wasn't either I barely graduated from high school um and then had a I don't this this took a lot of effort Natalie I had a 0. 0.6 GPA at the local community college wow my, after my first two years yes so I definitely had some fun. I didn't go to, I didn't go to class. Right. And, um, I now have, a an undergraduate degree in neuroscience from Smith college and a master's in clinical social work from Boston university with two tiers of licensure. Right. So it's not That's so cool. It doesn't have to be a straight line for everybody. And I'm not suggesting that people do what I did, which was go off and party way too much and, you know, not take things seriously. Cause it definitely gave me more to overcome. But the message that I was getting when I was in high school is that I was never going to be anything, right? So if I had actually listened, thank, thankfully, I had a home environment where I was told at any point I could turn things around, right? So I got both messages, luckily. What if I was getting both of those messages, like the only message that I was getting was that I had thrown my life away and I couldn't be anything. I might have bought into that and then just stayed the course, right? So I think it's really important that we also give kids the messages that at any point you can turn things around. Even yeah. if you feel like you're, you've screwed up so badly that you can't overcome, you can. And that college isn't necessarily the only pathway to success, right? There's multiple, multiple pathways to success. Yeah, for some reason, we've got this idea in our heads that like, once you become a teenager, you're in high school, like you're an adult, you're like supposed to have your life figured out kind of stuff. And that like, you if 
if you don't have your life figured out, like you need to start right now. Um, and obviously like if you can, that's great, but not everybody knows what they're doing at that age. I mean, I was really fortunate that, well, see, that's the thing is that I'm not fortunate that, um, that um, bad things happened in my life, but I'm fortunate that it showed me exactly what I wanted to do at a very early age. So I had that path that I wanted to go on, but not everybody starts that early. Not everybody um, knows what they want to do that early. And that's the more normal thing. I think a lot of people think my kind of way of thinking of, okay, I've known what I wanted to do for a job since I was like 12 years old. A lot of people think that's the norm, but it's not. Most kids come into college, even coming into like, even graduating college, don't know what they want to do. Yeah. Which is okay. And normal. Yeah. I mean, that there's an absolutely nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So we do have a question and just to throw it out there, we're accepting questions. So if anybody who is on the Zoom has a question, please put it right in the Q&A box. If you have a question and you're on Facebook Live, just put it right in the comment section and it will get to us. So a question is, how do we start to normalize helping high school students and parents see that non-college careers are accessible, viable, present solid career opportunities and can reduce some of the stress mental health issues from too much pressure of getting into a good college. I actually just did a podcast on this. Um, if anybody is interested, you can find it on my LinkedIn page um, nice. at Kristen Young. Um, this is, it's a great question. How do we normalize it? I think we start talking about it. What do you think, Natalie? I think that I know I'm kind of like harping on this idea of like starting early, um, but it definitely does start at the middle school level uh, because a lot of students you get like these career aptitude tests and things like that in middle school. And then you start like planning a future path for yourselves, especially if you have like um, trade high schools <clears throat> or like specialized high schools. So it's thought a lot about in middle school. And so we need to start this dialogue then. I think if we start it at the high school level, that's way too late, um, especially if students are in these specialized schools or they only have like certain options at their high school. So we need to start uh, talking about it a lot earlier. And then also like, I, I just prefacing, like I am in college, so I don't have like the best perspective on like non-college careers that are accessible. I just want to put that out there. Um, but I do know that a lot of high school counselors aren't really equipped to like guidance counselors or like college, college counselors, things like that. They aren't really equipped to give you other options other than like the state schools, community colleges and things like that. Um, I think that's a large problem that I found um, just like talking to my different friends who come from obviously different high schools, um, seeing that their college counselors didn't really know of that. They weren't really trained to talk about um, a diverse kind, a diverse group of options for them. They kind of had like, like three straight paths that they could go down and they were only like able to advise on like those paths. So I think another thing is training for people that work in the school system and getting them to realize that there are like many different options and giving them the resources to like teach about these different options. Absolutely. And parents. Yeah. We gotta, we gotta let the parents know. Cause I feel like most of my friends um, really have this idea that their kids have to go to college and that's, what's being promoted. And I, for one, my son started at five years old, telling me he didn't want to go to college. He used to sit in the five yard break all his toys and rebuild them. Okay. He was like, I don't want college. I want to fix things. I want to fix cars. I want to fix engines. That's what he's always wanted to do since he was little. And when he was five, before I started really thinking about this and working with this, I was like, oh, of course you're going to want to go to college. Right. So what was I doing? I was actually, he knew who he was and who he wanted to be. And I was making him question that which wasn't fair of me. Right. So we're pushing our kids oftentimes because of our own fears into in directions that might not actually fit them well. And for me, my goal for my son is happiness. It's not a career in anything or making a lot of money or any of that. If those are things that he wants to do for himself, then I want him to do it. But my goal has always been figure out what you enjoy and try to be able to support yourself doing that because I want him happy above all else. And this idea that our society has that everybody is supposed to be the best, I think is actually creating more harm than it's solving yeah. because not everybody can be the best. 
And when we think about it, our grandparents, all they ever really strove to be was average, right? Average has taken on this negative connotation. Like if I'm like, oh, Natalie, you're just average. How does that make you feel? Right? Not Not good. good. Not good. But is average actually negative? What does average mean? Average means you're like the majority of the people. You're right in the middle. It's not really a negative, right? I would all day long rather my child be average and happy than super successful CEO making millions and miserable, which by the way, is a reality. I see it all the time, right? So it's just some food for thought for parents out there who really have this idea, this preconceived notion, these expectations of who their kids are supposed to be. You might want to rethink that a little bit and actually let them figure out who they want to be, what fits them. And if that's a career and I mean, I I just renovated a house last summer. Let me tell you, plumbers and electricians are making way more than I do with my master's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they don't have the student loans I have, right? (laughs) So these careers are amazing careers that really people can be very successful in. And if they enjoy it, and it takes a lot of intelligence too. This idea that these are where the unintelligent people go is not not true. I mean, I can't fix an engine. Can you? (laughs) I open the hood of my car and I'm like, no, thanks. Like, Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I think another really interesting point is that it's also Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And a lot of, um, to preface, I am half Asian and I, a lot of, there's a lot of pressure within the API community to be this like certain level of success. Um, and I know that it is like a stereotype, but I found it true in my own personal life that there's a lot of uh, pressure to be, to go down like three paths, lawyer, doctor, engineer. And if you're not on those paths, like that's not successful. Uh, something I like to tell people that's kind of funny is that when I told my grandparents that I'm studying political science, they heard the word science and they were like, that's good. English isn't their first language. And I was like, okay, you guys didn't hear the political part, but that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Like, we'll go with it. As long as you're proud of me, that's, that's good. Um, but Asian Americans are the least likely group to seek mental health treatment because of like this stigma around um, our mental health and like the fact that we're supposed to like succeed at higher levels and this is such a convoluted issue so um but yeah it's the, also the idea of like the model minority myth where it's like um we are the model minority where we're like the smartest and so we're not actually like oppressed or things like that that harms us because it puts it it gives into the stigma of the idea that we're like successful and great and we don't need that mental health care. We don't struggle and things like that. So uh, that's a point that I'm trying to make this month is that um, we're not a model minority, that we struggle, that Asian Americans really need to work to break the stigma because we need to receive mental health care. I, I personally think that everybody should go to therapy. Um, Including oh, therapists, yeah. by the way. <laughs> yeah. Everybody everybody needs to go to therapy, um, especially people who are affected by these harmful stigmas. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And that's a, a very important piece. Um, I, I, I think it's really important that we give our kids somebody that they can talk to, that they can work some of this stuff out with, who is trusted and they can connect with. Because guess what, parents? They're not going to talk to us about it, most likely, and that's okay. And what I hear from most parents is, why didn't they come to me? They can trust me. I wish they'd talk to me. I wish. And I think it just, we have to be realistic about it. When I think about who I want to share some of my personal information, it's not always my mom, right? Sometimes it is, but it's not always and, or dad. Um, So we can't expect to be everything for our children. And we have to allow them to have somebody who's neutral because we're not, I don't expect to be, I am a therapist and I work with teens and I don't expect to be that person for my son. I, I expect him to tell me, I don't want to talk to you about that mom. Right. (laughs) Because he shouldn't have to, he has a right to his own personal business. He's 15 years old. He doesn't want to share everything with me. So as a parent, I feel like it's one of my duties to make sure he has people in his life, including a therapist that he can have these conversations with that I can trust (laughs) as well, that are going to guide him in a positive direction. Right. So just, you know, throwing that out there to parents, it's really hard um, because we want to be everything to our kids, but we just can't be, it's just not, that's just not realistic. Mm -hmm. Yep, we have. Uh, Parents are always going to worry about their children and teens are always going to experiment and test boundaries. How do we keep open lines of communication in the family without it leading to an argument? It's hard. Um, 
I, I think that one of the things that we have to do as parents is make it okay when our kids don't agree with us and be able to sit in that and be able to say things like, it's okay to disagree. It's okay for us not to agree on this. This is how I feel. How do you feel? Because oftentimes, and I struggle with this myself as a parent, I have certain ideas and things that I want my son to buy into. And that's not really fair. I, I don't have a right to tell him who he's supposed to be. My job is just to guide him into becoming who he is supposed to be and who he wants to be. Right. And this even, in my opinion, and this is not going to be a popular opinion, but in my opinion, this even, it's even when it comes to drugs and alcohol. And one of, one of the, the issues with this that I find is that parents can take the, you're not going to use, you can't use, that's it. I'm done. No more discussion. But has that worked? So what I like to do, at least in what I talk to parents about and what I do with my own son, I have a zero tolerance policy in my house. Okay. There's no drug use that it's not going to happen here. Um, I also started drug testing my son when he was about 12 years old, randomly. I told him when he was little, this, my house is a drug testing zone. It's not because I don't, you know, it's, it, well, it is because I don't trust you. This is something else that I find with teens, right? Parents have this idea that, well, I, I have to trust. I, I mean, they haven't given me any reason not to trust them. No, I don't trust teens guys. Okay. <laughs> like I just don't. And it's become a joke between my son and I, he'll be like, you don't trust me. And I'll be like, are you a teenager? And he'll be like, yes. And I'll be like, I don't trust any of you. And then he'll <laughs> laugh and I'll laugh. But the drug testing was never something to catch him because I wanted to punish him. And that was what I explained to him. It was something that I was going to do to help him because a, if he wants to say no, he has a reason to say no, because mom drug tests me. Mm. Right. So he can blame it on me and he can throw me under the bus all day long. So when teens are in that place where it's like, I don't really want to do this, but I'm feeling the peer pressure of needing to, I'm giving him an out, right? Mm -hmm. He can, he can use me and he's done this. Um, he does use it, but also I want to be able to know if he has used something again, not to punish, not to have an argument, not to tell him he's a bad kid. Cause I don't think he's a bad kid. Even, even the time that he decided he wanted to take an edible to see what it was like, I still don't think he's a bad kid. And I always told him that right from the beginning, I don't like that choice. And he knows that, but he's not a bad kid. So let's talk about it. Why did you do it? What do you need? What are you missing? Right. What's go? Because this is who you have said you don't want to be your whole life. So why is this changed? And we had a dialogue about it. There were consequences, but the consequences were given with discussion, not yelling, not screaming, not judgment. It was okay, but now I'm scared because I've seen what drugs and alcohol do to people. So now there's certain things like you're not getting, you, you spent my money. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to have my cash because I can't contribute to that. Right. That's my phone. You use that phone in order to get drugs. So now I can't trust you with that phone. So I'm gonna take the phone for 30 days, right? I love you and I'm here to support you, but there's, so I'm not gonna help you make these decisions for yourself, right? With the idea, I always say to him, you can become whoever you want in this world. It's not my job to tell you who to become. If this is who you wanna be, you can be that person, but this is what's gonna happen. This is what's gonna happen in my house because there's consequences for every choice you make. This is what could happen in society. How does that make you feel? Is this who you wanna be, right? So it's hard, it's hard being a parent. It's hard to navigate these things, but I think we have to stop really dictating to them what we think they should be, who, they th who, who we want them to be with all of these expectations and allow kids to kind of explore, not explore drugs and alcohol, not saying that, but explore the world with our support and our consequences without judgment. Does that make sense to you, Natalie? Yeah, that was awesome. Um, I really, really like the idea of like giving your, your child an out. Um, my mom also has done that recently and it's been really, really helpful for me because sometimes like you just can't come up with an excuse. Like you said, like for yourself, like it's like, what's like you're in the moment, you're like, I need a reason that I could say no, like everybody's doing it, blah, blah, blah. Like, I think that that's really, really awesome. Um, and I think that all parents should implement something like that. It doesn't have to be like drug testing, like something that um, my mom and I do is like, like I'll have her text me like, oh, you need to come home right now. And I'm like, oops, sorry, I gotta go home. Yeah, safe um, work. I don't live at home right now, but that um, was a good one. And then also, um, I'm not a parent, so I don't have that perspective. Um, but from the child's perspective, sometimes they're just looking for somebody to notice them, to notice that they're struggling. Um, and so they may act out in, in hopes of like getting that attention that 
that they need um, or somebody to just recognize that something is wrong. Um, so having somebody like have that open dialogue with them, like I really like what you said about like what's missing in your life, like who do you want to be? Um, having somebody say that to you is really eye-opening and having them actually get to like think about it and get that attention that they may be missing could prevent something really bad from happening. Oh, absolutely. I'm so glad you just said that. It's true. Uh, oftentimes, especially in your teenagers, you're not good. Most kids aren't going to go to their parents and be like, I'm really sad because yeah. it's just not going to happen. Right. A developmentally, a lot of times you just don't feel good and you don't know why. Yeah. Right. And, you know, a teenager is probably going to need some help figuring that out. So you're going to see it oftentimes. And this goes for younger kids, too. You're going to see it in the behaviors oftentimes before they're able to verbalize it or really understand it themselves. And even as a 45 year old woman, sometimes I don't know why I behave, <laughs> you know, certain ways. Like we got, we have to remember that our kids are actually human beings who are developing a, their brains aren't fully developed until they're about 25. Did you know that? I did. Yeah. Every time I hear that, I'm like still shocked because I feel like we're treating young kids as if they're like adults and like holding them accountable for decisions that like they don't really have full control over. Right. Yeah. And that's, and this is another really important thing to talk about and to understand with teenagers, because the part of the brain that is full, that manages emotions is fully developed by the time they're about 12, which mm. is interesting that that was your age. Right? Yeah. So you're feeling emotions to the same degree as an adult at 12 years old, your brain cannot mitigate, understand, or control those emotions fully until you're 25. Because the master control of the brain, which is the, the prefrontal cortex, um, is not fully developed until then. So oftentimes this is why we see a lot of impulsivity. This is why, because kids like literally teenagers do not have the ability developmentally to see consequences. So this is where parents come in. I often tell parents, like, we kind of got to be that prefrontal cortex until it's yeah. full, fully developed, right? So we have to come in and sit down and be able to say, okay, so what happened when you made that decision? Did that feel good? What might happen? We actually have to help kids think this stuff through yeah. because they're not biologically able to do it. And when I think about this, driving in fast cars when I was younger, like making all these decisions, that was, that was this. And when I think about the age that I was able to actually turn things around, I was about 24 years old. That's when I went off to Smith, right? Why aren't we telling, why, why don't we teach families this? I feel like if there was a parenting manual, this should be in it, right? And for you guys, because when I start to talk to kids about this stuff, they're like, oh, so I'm not just a bad kid. No, this is a normal. So sad. That's something to say that. Oh, I hear it all the time. Right. And now let's talk about this for a second. Then you get the, the puberty and the hormones. Yeah. And that actually affects those emotions. So this yeah. is why you see boys putting their hand through walls because testosterone makes you angry and girls start their moods start to fluctuate because that's what estrogen does. And the brain can't mitigate that. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lot. Our kids are dealing with a lot. And what I oftentimes, what I started to tell my son when I first started him see him go through puberty was buddy you're going to feel things and they're going to feel really intense and sometimes you're not going to understand why such a small thing has made you so angry and that's this and you mm -hmm. got to take a walk <laughs> walk it off give it some time give it some space right go punch a punching bag it's normal to feel that way at this age mm -hmm. so we have another um question Natalie, the world is so different than when I was young. What do you think is affecting the young people's mental health the most in today's society? Oh, uh, social media, 100%. Um, I, that's kind of a cliche now because I feel like everybody says that, but it is so true, especially as social media is involving more and more and different platforms are coming out like TikTok. Uh, I think TikTok has actually been beneficial for people's mental health because it's a lot more real than the other social medias are because people are actually like talking and showing different parts of their lives. Whereas like Snapchat and Instagram, it's like you just post like the best moments of your life and that's all other people see. So I really hope that we are moving towards like, there's a new app that's out there that's called Be Real, um, where it gives you like a notification at a random time of day and you have to take a picture of whatever you're doing um it's supposed to like be real uh so i really hope that we are moving towards more social medias that um show the real sides of people um but 
as of now, when Instagram is still like the biggest platform that young people are using, that is 100% affecting people's mental health the most. Mm -hmm. And I would agree. I see it all the time in therapy with teens. They come in, they're feeling depressed and sad because they were home on Friday or Saturday night and all they saw was all these posts. And it's really hard. I mean, even as an adult, I think we feel it sometimes. Yeah. FOMO. Yeah. Lots of FOMO is like for real. And I think it's it's getting worse and worse and worse. So we have um, a, a statement slash question. Thank you so much for discussing your approach, approach to parenting your children regarding drug use. You're welcome. Um, thank you, Natalie, for giving your perspective on sobriety in college. Have any of your peers decided to remain sober because of your example? Yes. Um, a lot of my friends uh, will always like join me going to parties sober or like, like they'll, instead of like going to drink, they'll buy like they're buying like the sparkling cider for me and then they'll just drink it themselves. And it's really interesting because that doesn't happen in like other friend groups that I see. Uh, So I think that having just like one sober person in the friend group, and it also does help that I have like that story behind my sobriety. Um, I think that's another like very um, important factor to it is that I'm able to say like, I'm sober and if people are like, oh, like, why are you doing that? I'm like, well, because I'm in recovery and because I went through all of this and and um, I just, I can't get back into it. And then people automatically like respect that. And then they're like, oh, okay. I don't want to drink in front of you because I don't want to trigger that. Um, and even if I'm like, no, it's fine. Like you don't have to do that. Like oftentimes they'll be like, no, like I I, I really respect you. And like, I, I, I just don't want to do that for you. And obviously I'd never ask anyone to do that for me, but um, they end up doing it, which is really cool. And so uh, we are, shout out Heron Project, we are going to be developing some college resources very soon, hopefully bring Heron Project clubs to the college campus. So I'm really hoping that we can get like even just one person on these college campuses to affect like all these other people in their lives and hopefully bring about a a more sober culture here. Hmm. That's awesome. That's really awesome. Definitely much, much needed. We need to normalize it it needs to be okay to not party in college and in life yeah or party sober or party yeah right no i'm and i should have qualified that not party with substances yeah yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. now i have a question about what your thoughts are on on marijuana and what the legalization has has done in terms of your age group um do you think that it's changed anything actually kind of grew up with it being more legal but have you noticed an, an uptake? Yeah, you're right. I, I wasn't really old enough to know like what was going on before I was like becoming legalized. Um, I think people definitely have a more normalized opinion on it now. Um, whereas like it's always I always hear the thing where it's like, oh, yeah, no, like even if I smoke, smoke every day or drink every day, as long as I'm not like doing cocaine, it's fine. Um, and so I think people have this idea that because it's being legalized, that means that um, it's like fine for you. I think that's that's one of my biggest problems with alcohol is that because it's legal, people don't really understand the effects that it can have on your body, on your system, on your life. Um, and so I worry about people thinking the same thing with marijuana. I always hear the fact that it's like, oh, well, marijuana isn't addictive and things like that. And it's like, that doesn't mean it can't ruin your life. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I bring this up just because I feel like this is a big issue for a lot of families at this point is marijuana use with um, with their teens in high school. It's gotten bigger and bigger. Not that alcohol isn't still a problem. And by the way, alcohol is still the leading death. It co- it's the leading, the substance that leads to the most death right now. It's still the top one, wow. which a lot of people don't realize. I think people starting to think it's opiates, but it's actually not. It's alcohol. Alcohol related deaths are still number one. So yeah, I wouldn't have thought that either. When our society starts to talk about how how safe alcohol is or how normal it is and how it's actually abnormal not to drink alcohol. We have to always remember how dangerous of a drug it actually is. Yeah. But marijuana is another important topic because for me, um, I don't see marijuana and alcohol as any different. I don't know why one would be legal and the other would be <laughs> not legal. And I understand actually the criminalization of it has actually led to some more problems and all yeah. of that. So I'm not going to take a stance on the overall legalization of it. I want to talk for a second about teens because 
what people don't often understand is the mechanism. One of the mechanisms in marijuana is cannabinoids. We know this is called cannabis, right? One of the mechanisms that actually helps the brain, the neurons in the brain to connect is the can cannabinoid system. So until the brain is fully developed, we're not so sure what marijuana is doing to that developing brain because it in it is cannabinoids so you are affecting the system that is wiring the brain and a lot of teens don't understand this so it's a and, and particularly now that marijuana is so much more potent than it was 20 years ago yeah. because of all the genetic engineering and all that stuff yeah. we're actually seeing a lot of teens end up on psych on psychiatric wards yeah. in psychosis yeah. from marijuana, which we never saw before. We didn't really see this 20 years ago. So I just want to put that out there. So families understand when your team comes home and says it's, it's natural, it's safe, it's legal. Um, mm -mm, not for teens. I'm not going to wage any judgment at all for a 50 year old that has no substance use issue that wants to come home and smoke a joint, whatever, do you think mm -hmm. have at it? A 16 year old, it's actually not that safe. So we got to make sure our kids understand this because they don't. Have you ever heard this before, Natalie? Yeah, and in my personal experience, a lot of uh, young people get their marijuana in very suspicious ways, meaning that there's a high probability that it's laced. And as we know, like fentanyl has really been getting around and killing people. Um, and so the chance that it's laced with something like fentanyl is growing and growing, making it even more dangerous, which is really, really scary. It's very scary. And that's, that's a whole nother thing we have to talk about um, is the, you know, when I was your age, substances were not good and they were dangerous, but it's a different ball game today. It yeah. is frightening out there. And we have to make yeah. sure all of our kids are aware of that, you know, as well. Yeah. Um, what are the signs parents should look out for that could mean their teen is struggling with substances? What do you think, Natalie? What would you cool. say? Um, you might you might want to go first from the parent okay. perspective, I'll think. Um, it's so this is a tough one because oftentimes what we see that are normal teenage behaviors also are very close to what you see when your teen is using substances. So mm -hmm. um I don't I don't want to sit there and what what often happens is is we go through the signs and parents are like, oh my god, my teen is doing all of these things. Okay, it's some of these. It, what I want to throw out there is a significant change in behavior. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what we want to look for is a sig any significant change in behavior. That's what you want to notice first. So if your child is a classic introvert, has always been a classic introvert, likes to be alone, spends a lot of time in their bedroom reading, doesn't, has never really loved sitting at the dinner table and having conversations and all that stuff. And then it's, it's probably just the fact that your child is an introvert and you don't have to freak out. Okay. But if your child used to be a social butterfly and loved being around you guys, and all of a sudden it was almost like a switch was flipped mm -hmm. and they no longer are doing all of the things that they used to enjoy. They're no longer wanting to spend time with the family. Their friend group has changed. That's another really important one. Sometimes it, it happens like that. All of a sudden you're like, what happened to little Johnny who you've been friends with since you were three? Um, oh, I don't know. I don't, we don't hang out. I don't really like him anymore. Whatever. That's an indicator that something might be up. Okay. So any significant changes that, that all of a sudden you kind of like, what, what is going on here? You want to have a discussion and you want to do, this is what Chris says. And I fully, fully, fully believe this, sit down beside them and say, what's going on? Whatever you're doing is okay. The world hasn't ended. Whatever choices you've made, I'm not judging you. I will love you until the end of time. If you have made some choices you're not proud of, so have I. That's okay. That's being human. Let's talk. I want to help you. Not the what's wrong with you? Why are you acting this way? Like judgmental anger, which by the way, if there are any young people watching, we do this as parents because we're scared. <laughs> okay. This is a fear response of ours. We're trying to almost bully you a little bit into going back and doing the things that you used to do that made us safe and comfortable. And if you're a parent and you're listening, um, please hear that. Your anxiety, it's not your kid's responsibility to take away your anxiety. It's your responsibility to learn to sit in that. That's so that. <laughs> that's our work as parents, right? I'm still working on that. It's a hard one to do. <clears throat> 
but we got to get a little bit better at sitting down beside our kids and asking why I really, and really like what you said about the friend group, especially um, because I think at any point in my life, like you could tell a lot about how I was doing by the people that I'm surrounding myself with. And I think that my mom's intuition about like the kind of people I surround myself with has always been right. Like every time she's ever been like, oh, I don't like this person. I don't think they're a good influence. Like she, she's always been right. Even if I couldn't see that at the time, I was like, oh, mom, like, like they're my friend, like whatever. But she, she was always right. Um, so I think that uh, the friend group thing is a huge one because you're right. You can't really tell sometimes like I kept, um, granted it was middle school, but I kept straight A's all of seventh and eighth grade um, while I was like in the depths of struggling. And so a lot of people took that as like, oh, she's actually fine. Like it, it's she's actually okay. okay. Um, but if you looked at like the kinds of places that I was going, the kinds of people I was surrounding myself with, that kind of stuff, it, it could tell a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And what would you say about that? This is a struggle I know a lot of families have. There's a friend that mom and dad don't like they know that they're a bad influence um so they try to say you can't hang out with that person what are your thoughts on that situation yeah so that actually happened to me um and it, it's really interesting because like from the child's perspective it's like come on like you you should let me like make my own decisions but it was like it's I guess it's kind of a unique thing because I was at a point where I was like seriously harming myself and doing seriously dangerous things and so when my parents were like you're grounded like you're 100% not seeing these people even though I would like sneak out and see them like they needed to do that as much as I didn't want them to do that and like looking back now even I'm like oh like maybe they should have like let me like make my own decisions figured out for myself like that was the best thing for my health so I think just like there is a point where you need to make the call where, where it's like you can let them like explore and like try and figure it them out, figure it out themselves but there may be a point where it's like you just can't let it happen anymore and you have to do everything in your power to like keep them physically safe because obviously that should be first priority it, that's a tough one it's yeah. such a tough one it's such a tough one I and I I mean I faced it in my household as well I, the way that I see it and the way that I try to coach families into dealing with it is almost pretty much exactly what you said. I don't, I would never facilitate my son spending time with somebody who I know is making poor choices. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I would say to my son that per, I, I don't dislike him. I think he's a, he's a, probably a good kind hearted kid, but he's making really bad choices. Exactly. Right. So then we have a discussion around what happens if he's making poor choices and you're around. Mm -hmm. And I would always say to my son, you are responsible for that. If you get in trouble for something somebody else does and you're in that proximity, you're still responsible because you've made the choice to be there. You've made the choice to support this and spend your time around this kid. So mm -hmm. I'm never going to hear it's his fault that I, that this happened to me. Never. So just be aware mm -hmm. of that one Two, I'm not going to facilitate you spending time with this person. I am not going to have this person in my home because I choose not to be around this person. If you choose to spend time with him when you're at school, when you're, that's your choice, it's your life, but just know your proximity to this person, you are responsible for anything that happens. I like that a lot. I think it's really easy to like shift the blame to that other person, but recognizing that like at the end of the day, they are the one making the decision. Right. Yeah. And that's, it's a tough one. It's a really tough one to navigate as, as parents. So I'm so glad you came on today. I want to give you a couple minutes to talk about the cool stuff we have coming up at Heron Project, um, like the youth conference and whatnot. So you want to tell us a little bit about, um, and your, all of your social media stuff too, which is so fun and so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So social media stuff, first of all, we are Heron B Youth on Instagram, for youth, by youth, um, Instagram account where we share fun stuff. We have the Inspire Youth Conference coming up July 29th. I believe hopefully that date is right. Um, you can register at the link in our bio on Heron B Youth um, or in like the link tree on Heron Projects Instagram. Chris Heron's going to be speaking there. Uh, we have a lot of fun activities planned for that uh, conference. So it's really, really exciting. It's at URI. 
Um, we also have a podcast that will be coming out this month called The Purple Effect. Um, it's going to be starring all of our youth ambassadors. The first episode is them telling their stories. And it was super fun to record because even though I've been working with them for like a year now, hearing them talk about their personal lives and the activism and the stuff that they do in um, their communities is so inspiring. And, it, and I just love that it's this group of high schoolers and they're doing so much. So definitely look out for that. It'll be out on all platforms. And yeah, our youth ambassador applications open June 1st. So if anyone on here or anyone's child is interested in that, make sure to keep an eye out for that because we are building the program a lot with like a mentoring program and the conference and maybe an ambassador retreat, so much fun stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of good coming up. And I just want to throw out there too, your kids don't have to be completely sober and have already chosen a sober lifestyle to get involved in different ways with our organization. Yeah. We just want to encourage health, healthy choices, yeah. um, you know, and creating a, a healthy, happy society and individual and giving our kids outlets and coping mechanisms and things like that. So, yeah. so please don't think that you have to be fully sober and have committed to a life of sobriety in order to get involved in different ways with us. Although that would be awesome, but yes. <laughs> that's not, that's like rainbows and unicorns land. <laughs> so, well, Natalie, thank you so much for coming on. I'm so excited to have had you here. And I just want to tell you, your story is amazing. And um, I feel like it gives a lot of us so much hope, especially those families out there struggling right now with teens who are having mental health issues and substance use issues. And by the way, those are the same, you guys. For those of you that think that substance use is separate from mental health issues, it's not. <laughs> the mental health issues are the foundation in which the substance use is built. Those are the, pro that's the actual problem. The substance yeah. use is the symptom of the larger problem. So we need to start looking at it like that. Yeah. That's where the idea of asking your kids why comes up, yeah. right? The why is way more important than the what. Yep. Thank you so much for having me. This has been awesome. You're welcome. And I will definitely have you on again someday. Soon. I love that. <laughs> and thank you to everyone who joined us today. This will be up um, on our YouTube channel and on our website. So if you ever want to rewatch it or you want to send it to somebody you know that you think would benefit from it, please do. So thank you, Natalie. Thank you. Bye-bye.